Good evening, and welcome to Nurturing Our Roots. Karen and I are happy to be back. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hi, Antoinette. Good to see you. It's good to see you, too. I'm just happy that we're back in the studio, and I, uh, I'm i just excited because we have so much to share, and we thank everybody that's joining us uh, this afternoon as we talk about some of the new updates that uh, have been going on since we last spoke to everybody. But, Karen, we are in season 20. Isn't That's that amazing? amazing. <laughs> and that means that we're we're reaching a lot of people who want to know about their family history. Uh Karen, it's been 30 something years for me now. <laughs> and I am not tied yet. What about you? Well, you know, I'm I, I have been in the game much shorter than you have. And there's just not enough hours in a day to get everything done that I want to get done, to research everything I want to research. And now you have a new addition to the family. You have added a new addition to the family, right? Yes, yes. I have a new grandson. In fact, he's uh, nine months old. Uh, Just a few days ago, he turned nine months old. So this will be his first Christmas. Really, really, really. So uh, we want to thank you all for joining us. We want to talk about some tips because, Karen, I get a lot of emails on Instagram, Facebook, inboxes of people want to know how to get started. Karen, do you find that more people today are researching their family history than before? Well, I think so. I think that uh, with the DNA and everything, that's kind of thrust a lot more people into it. And also because so much is available online, like when you started doing this, everything was, you had to go to the locations uh, to to do the research. And so I think the combination of a lot of records being available online and people doing their DNA, those numbers are just constantly going up and up. I think more people than ever before are uh, researching their family history. And, you know, Karen, I want to share that with you that um, since the last segment of our show, Richardson's Funeral Home donated another collection of funeral programs. So we are up to maybe 15, no, 1,600. That's that amazing. we have preserved, yes. I yes. hope more uh, funeral homes and churches will jump on that bandwagon and start um, making their uh, funeral programs and obituaries uh, available so that people can use them for research. You know, Karen, we, we really have to look at ways that we can discuss with some of the churches, how to and why preserve some of the church records. Now, let's look at it the way it is now. You know, you don't see that many church programs in the churches like you used to see a long time ago. So we see in that change a little bit. Have you Absolutely. noticed that? Yeah, I, I you know, I, I went to um, a funeral at a church back in October. And uh, sadly, it was for my sister-in-law. And um and, and so even when you have family funerals at a church, those churches, if the secretary would just hold on to those programs, mm-hmm. um, that it, it can still be done. And I think about in the Catholic church, at least you have a record through their sacramental records. Mm-hmm. Process. Mm-hmm. But all the other denominations, if they, you know, if they could uh, hold on to those programs, uh, but also just began to just keep track of their own church members, you know, birth, marriages, and burials. If it's coming through the church, you know, baptisms, I'm sorry, baptisms, marriages, and burials. If it's coming through the church, keep a record of it. I think the Catholic church is one of the leading uh, organized religions that basically keep records. I, I, what do you think? I, uh, from what I have seen, but it, it wouldn't hurt other churches to do it. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. I mean, most churches I know of have church secretaries. There's, uh, you know, some churches keep track of their own church history. Uh, this would just be something um, that the church secretary could keep. A, there could be a log book at the church. If, a, if people are getting baptized, uh, who the parents are, who's getting baptized, the date and all of that stuff, and who the godparents are. Uh that's easy to do. I spoke with Cheryl Montgomery about two weeks ago, and she was basically talking about uh, 
some type of genealogy event that they're planning to do. And with this genealogy event, they are really wanting to talk about the history of these funeral programs. When did they start? And it's very difficult because that's not any written. I haven't found anyone that wrote a thesis or a paper or the history on the funeral program. So I would say my earliest knowledge of funeral programs, the late 60s, the very late 60s mm -hmm. and the 70s is when uh, most of the funeral homes that I have spoke with started to notice that these funeral uh, programs was being kept in the church. And also keep in mind that uh, uh, obituaries in the newspaper used to be a thing. It's not, right. uh, not a thing anymore. Right. I find many, many people are dying and the families are not getting it put in the newspaper because of the cost. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, many of the funeral homes have their their own their website and their online um of uh, obituary process. that's right that's right but mm -hmm. we have to make sure that whichever way it goes this information is being captured now i found since covid that some most a lot of the funeral homes now are live streaming the funerals i guess with the fa mm -hmm. with the family's permission so you're seeing more of the the funeral homes using different technologies now than once before. Uh, I went to my cousin's funeral and I noticed that a lot of the young people wasn't even trying to get one of the, the paper <laughs> funeral programs. And basically when you leave a church and you see all the, the funeral programs on a seat, uh, a lot of times that didn't happen 30 years ago. People was just, you know, can I get one? Can I get one? So, and we're seeing more, young people in the younger generation looking at the t-shirts they're looking at the handkerchiefs different things like that that they are uh, reflecting upon their family members um and and that's right because young people don't want to deal with paper mm -hmm. and so right. we have to uh keep that in mind of uh, finding ways that this can evolve mm -hmm. in, in ways that uh make young people want to have the information because there's only so much information that's going to be on a t-shirt and a handkerchief, right? That's but right. Um, we got to find ways to show young people the family history part that they're not getting from that. And that's going to be so much more important moving forward because you don't have families that look the way they used to look. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if you go back before the 1940s, Almost everybody, you know, you have mama, daddy, and oftentimes grand, a grandparent mm -hmm. living in a household and all of that. And now, I mean, I can't tell you the number of people who I run into who don't even, they'll say, well, my mom won't tell me who my dad is. Yeah. And so yeah. they're already starting at a disadvantage in terms of being able to have that family history to pass forward. And something else we need to also talk about is a lot of young people, they they prefer to have photographs on their phone. No one want a printout picture, a copy of a photograph, you know, mm -hmm. so we're seeing something totally different and you can't always trust external hard drives, flash drives, uh, the cloud, where the cloud is, you, you know, but no one, this generation, they don't really care about the photo album. So, you know, I don't know, you know, what do we do? How do, what, how do we start to, discuss these type of uh, discussions within genealogy organizations and societies. What happens to grandmother's pictures? What happened to mama's pictures? You know, when no one really wants the physical copy of the picture. You have any, any thoughts on that one? Absolutely. Uh, I say we still share the physical pictures, but also mm -hmm. give them a CD and uh, give them a, a flash drive. Uh, put it on, create an online, uh, whether it's your own um, website or using one of the other services like Flickr or Google Photos. I say do it all. You, you do a lot of creating stories on your social media. So mm -hmm. I say you do it all. You, you create the stories on the social media. You put it in multiple places in addition to sharing it electronically with as many family members as possible. So, and you know, uh, 
And Karen, I also like to blog about it because with the text, there's an image. And I am pleased to announce that um, the Drum newspaper and I, well, Nurturing Our Roots, have partnership. So we have formed this partnership. And so now most of the stories or the stories that we share can be also found in the online publication of the newspaper, So, which is really good. And so the blogs help me to share photographs and not only to share the photographs, but also share the, the history in text with the readers. And I think that uh, you do ev everything as much as you can possibly do, because I also find that uh, a lot of young people don't read online newspapers. Right. They do right. the TikTok, Instagram. They don't even do Facebook that much anymore. So I think, uh, you know, you you're going to have to constantly evolve. evolve. Yeah. Const it's got to be constant evolving. Mm -hmm. Before we move on, I just want to uh, say hello to everybody. I'm, I'm looking at the YouTube chat. Uh, to everyone um, in the YouTube chat and share in the YouTube chat how do you keep your family members, especially your young people, informed about who's who's in some of these family photographs? Uh, do you have cherished uh, family photographs that you want to share? And uh, maybe you haven't thought about it before today and maybe from this day forward you'll think about some ways to share. I, I just believe you just got to do multiple things and uh, just constantly sharing with people Rather, uh, your texting photos. One thing mm -hmm. my son has been doing um, is he created a little, um, I guess, what iPhones you could share. You could have sh uh, shared albums. Mm -hmm. And he's invited several family members to that shared album. So from time to time when he uploads a picture, of, he'll upload a picture of the baby. And so I, I get to see it. My sister, my niece, my husband, you know, we all get to see it. I mean, that's that's another way of just sharing within the family. Um, and that's what this generation is all about, using electronics. They're not the ones that's going to have, you know, 10 albums. You know, sometimes you can go and you pull all these albums out. They're not going to be those people, so we can yeah. forget that. That's not going to not going to be a baby book either. <laughs> that's right. That's old school. You know, you know what I have seen some of my friends do? Some what? of my friends have an Instagram page for their babies. Uh-huh. Even my grandson has a private Instagram page. Uh so then so my son just invites whoever he wants to invite to it. And I guess that's their way of uh sharing those early photos and everything. And I've, we have to well, embrace all of those ways. Let's mm -hmm. just be very clear here. We mm -hmm. have to embrace all those ways. But now I want to also talk about something that uh, recently came about last year. No, that wasn't last year. It was this year. I forgot. We're at the end of the year already. I um, made a statement with the Department of Justice for the Reparations Initiative in California. Now, everyone know that we end up saying, uh, uh, agreeing that it should be lineage-based. And so that means that the people who lives in California, whose ancestors was enslaved, they are going to have to make that genealogical connection. And I do believe that as we proceed to study reparations, there should be fundings allocated for family members who want to do their genealogy research because genealogy uh, number one, let me just say, it's not a hobby. It is not a hobby. You, you know, especially caring for, I, I am a descendant of those that was enslaved and so was you on the Harrell side. And so we know the, the huge undertaking we take on to just find the missing pieces to that puzzle. So just for people to know that, you know, you got to start talking to Let's talk about some, some tips right now. Talking to the oldest person in your family. We say it too often to ourselves and to other family members. If only I would have took the time to talk to Aunt Jane. Now, I thought I had some time and she passed away just last week. You, you see, how many times you hear those type of stories? Well, no, I'm just looking here at the chat on YouTube. Uh, Chris Jackson says, I recently got a shirt made with my third great grandmother all the way down to my grandmother. 
And that's that's great. I, I'm just awesome. glad to hear that that shirt had multiple generations on it. That is um, awesome. That's yes. awesome. Uh, my uh, my mother in law just turned 98 years old on Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, Happy birthday! Uh, <laughs> and uh, you know she, you know I'm so thankful that um, several years ago I recorded her uh, talking about her childhood when she started to vote different mm -hmm. people in the family and uh, even on Sunday she was talking about some of her um her her mother's people um you know and these are and her mother died at 102 and so when she saw uh, her mother was raised by her uncle and you know we're going back you know many many years now into the people born in the 1800s my husband's grandmother was born in 1898, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so my grand, my mother-in-law remembers these people, some of whom w had been enslaved. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, she was born in the 1920s. So she knew some of these people. And yeah, so wow. she's a, she was able to pass on some of, mm -hmm. of those uh, family stories to, mm -hmm. to us. And it's up to us. And now I'm so glad I video recorded her and I shared that at a family reunion. And I, I still have some, I have the raw, the raw footage of that. And I encourage more people to interview your family. Mm -hmm. member. Uh, if it's just, a, it doesn't have to be your grandmother, great grandmother. If they're not around, interview aunts, uncles, other, Cousins. whoever the oldest people in your family. Mm -hmm. Don't let a family gathering go by without recording uh, some conversations with the oldest people in the family. I thought about you last night. I was going through my old dinosaur VHS collection. And what I saw, I pulled out a family holiday gathering that took place 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And who did I see and who did I hear singing? Your grandmother. <laughs> so on that one video, it's your grandmother, your great aunt, your great uncle, and other Harrell cousins. And to see my mom and four of her brothers, and now all four of them are deceased, mm -hmm. just to see them, just to hear their voices. And a family member said to me the other day, he said, you know, it's one thing to have pictures, but to actually have a video where you can hear them talk and you can, you know, you can get to hear what they're saying. And so, yes, by all means, um, we are, we have evolved into a new time that we must embrace in documenting our history. And we all have these, right? That's right. <laughs> these phones. These phones. We all have these phones. And so uh, that's why it should be easier for us to, at any family gathering, uh, have conversations uh, with uh, the older people in the family to find out uh, just a little bit about what it was like when they were growing up. Uh, some of the other people that they remember that uh, you may not have ever heard of uh, who and, are part of your family. And it's important. It's, uh, it's very important, especially for those who live in California. They need to ask names of, of uh, family members, grandparents, locations, dates. How do they know this information? Where they get the information from? if they have any documentation, and if you're going to uh, retrieve any records from the courthouse, let me strongly suggest to you that you make sure you make it a certified copy from the courthouse because anything that has to be lineage-based, you, you will not be able to walk into court with a copy of something, right? going to want a true copy. So I would say to you, if you're one of those families who live in California and you know that uh, the, the uh, case for reparations is on the table, being talked about all the time, start conducting your genealogy. That's all I'm going to say to that. Well, you know, Antoinette, um, as you know, my husband descends from uh, I was I used to say nine. It's actually ten direct line ancestors who were enslaved by the Jesuits of Georgetown University, 
And here lately, I've been hearing of more and more universities doing research mm -hmm. on who are the descendants of people their universities enslaved. Mm -hmm. uh, in a few years, uh, descendants of uh, people enslaved by the Jesuits of Georgetown will be able to apply for um, uh, funding for scholarships. Mm -hmm. There are other descendants who are pushing for reparations. Uh, you know, the, jo the Jesuits haven't agreed to that, but there are other descendants who are pushing for reparations. And let and me just not gonna stop pushing. Right. Let me be clear. The uh, Georgetown University does not give free tuition to people who descend from uh, those uh, who were enslaved by the Jesuits. Uh, they don't. Uh, but uh, there is an organization that has been working toward trying to get funding uh, so that descendants can apply for, for, for scholarships to go wherever they want to go. And they're going to have to be able to prove their lineage. They will have to be able to show through documents from themselves mm -hmm. to their parents, mm -hmm. to their grandparents, and f all the way back to their enslaved ancestors. So and, it, it, they have to have evidence. They have to have evidence, and I'm sure these other universities are gonna I'm be gonna the same saying. way. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's been a long, long fight, and the fight continues for um, reparations or uh, reparative justice for our enslaved ancestors. Uh, but I believe that one day uh, we will see a uh, broader base reparations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why it's very important to start collecting your genealogical information as it regards to your family. Names are important. Locations are important. Um, write it down. Find out exactly where, what state, what county, what parish, you know, and start, you know, collecting your information and making that information available to other people in the family matter of fact make it a group make it a family project right now that we are all doing these uh zoom calls and all of this with family members that's a perfect way to share that information with family and you know just there are all kinds of documents some people say oh well you know i come from slaves and and uh you know that we didn't have last names uh, 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 no some of us had last names. Mm -hmm. I was looking at a ship manifest from Alexandria, Virginia to the port of New Orleans. I was looking at it last night and um, these people had last names. Uh, they had last names uh, because it, if you're coming in on a ship after 1808, they had to prove that they weren't smuggling you in from the transatlantic slave trade. And so many people on that manifest, they had last names. Uh, and, and the reason I was looking at that is because I was helping someone with their DNA. And I saw uh, this particular DNA match that had this family in it. And I'm like, wait a minute, I've seen that family before. And I, I found um, the, the ship manifest. 1835 mm -hmm. was when that manifest. Mm -hmm. So there, you can go beyond the 1870 census. You can find your people on court documents, mortgage papers from the slave owner. Succession uh, records. Succession records. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, inventories from the probate. You know, our people, our, our ancestors' names were written in many places. The, uh, the work contracts, the Freedmen Bureau work contracts after slavery ended. That's uh, right. They're so, mm -hmm. in addition to the church records we talked about earlier, so I know it's there's nothing easy about this. There's it's not easy, but the records do exist. But you start with yourself and you work your way back, mm -hmm. finding all the census records you could find, all the birth, marriage, and death records you could find. And all of those records actually help you find more generations moving backwards. And that's why the funeral home, the funeral programs play a very significant part because most of the funeral programs list the parents. It will list uh, where they're buried at. It will list what church, you know, most of the family members use the same church that their grandmother, 
you know, uh, and that's very important because let me just remind you, yes, all everything you just mentioned, but do not forget to talk to the oldest person in the family. Well, guess what else we shouldn't forget? When you see where somebody's buried at, go to the cemetery. Because once you get to that cemetery, you're going to see even more family members. Mm -hmm. It might sound strange, but I actually just like to go walk through the cemetery. I didn't always like to, but I do now that I do genealogy. Because when I'm walking through the cemetery, you see a lot of times additional family members are buried right there that you may not have ever knew existed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And most of the time they're in the same area too. Mm -hmm. I, and, and, you know, because I do the DNA, I have been able to find people whose ancestors are in their trees who are my DNA matches and then go find, and then I just happened upon these folks who have died many years ago. I happened mm -hmm. upon their, their gravestone mm -hmm. in the cemetery. That's Karen, crazy. have you, have you, um, I know you have seen the new, layout that ancestry have would identify if you were related on the mother's side, the father's side, that has been so helpful to me. What about you? It has been so helpful. It showed me some things I had wrong. I had identified certain people as being on my maternal side um, or, or, or my paternal side, either way. And I had it wrong, especially for my aunt, my grandmother's sister. I had so many people wrong. And then I was also able to see that we were double related. So she was related to some of them on both her mother's side and her father's side. And so oh. it, it has been a game changer actually and and helping me straighten some things out, but also opening my eyes to some other information um, because I wasn't able to put certain DNA matches in, mm -hmm. in a particular category. Now that I am, it is a game changer. You know, um, I would definitely like to pull it up to see um, if we can share so people can see what we're talking about. Do you have it open on your screen or can you? I'll, I'll, I'll work on um, getting it um, on my screen and pulled up in a way that doesn't um, um, share any other people's information. I don't mind sharing my information. Right. You're um, right. And... Um, and so I'll it share helped it. me out a great deal. Um, yeah, it, it is. Know. It is absolutely very helpful. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to share just briefly. You have permission to share as well. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you know, with our new system here, you know, I was so used to using uh, Ancestry. I have to now. Oh, that's I guess I use present. Uh huh. Okay. And share the screen. Mm -hmm. Let's see here if I'm doing this right. <laughs> oh goodness, maybe we might have to try this on another one. It wants me to change something. Let's see. It wants me to open my system preferences. Um. Okay, I, I'll I'll keep working on it. Um, okay. in the uh, meantime, to make it happen, uh, since this is my first time using our new uh system, um, but it what I will do is on our next show if I can't yeah, have it, have it available mm -hmm. show, on our next show, I'll have it um pulled up so that we could easily um to do we could easily share it. Let me just go into a break and see if I can pull it up. So give me a mm -hmm. minute. Let's go into okay. A break.
Karen. Let me see. I think I may have it. I'm going to try to find out anyway and see if I did get it. Nope. Let's see. Windows. All right. Got it. All right. Okay. Got it. You see it? Okay. Let's just do this. Let's see if I can. All right. I would have to play around with this a little bit. Go to your DNA tab. Mm-hmm. And click data. Click what? Where you match it with the, the, the green in the middle screen where it says beta. Mm -hmm. And so it shows you your parent one and mm -hmm. your parent two. And so what I did was I edited and once I was able to figure out, okay, parent one, that's my maternal side. I know it is. And so I would, I would just click edit and I changed it to maternal. And so it was able to change all my, parent one matches to maternal if that's you know what the case is for you um mm -hmm. and then it changed all it automatically changed my so yeah, i could already see which one's yours so parent two is your maternal side but karen do you see that name blackburn yes yes and so i have not found any blackburns but this is all the names that i know connects and i was happy to see blackburn Yes, because those are the names that are in the trees of your DNA matches from that side of the family. And you and, know what? And that's Priscilla Blackburn. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Randall's wife. Exactly. And so because you know what part of your family, because if uh, you know that the Harrell side is on your mom's side, mm -hmm. you would automatically know to change, to edit that to be your maternal side. That's right. And what I will tell you that it is different with everyone. As you know, I have my husband my, and my children. For mm -hmm. one of my sons, parent one is maternal. For my other son, parent one is paternal. So it's not always going to be consistent. And uh -huh. I don't know why that is, uh, but it's not always consistent. So I just want to share with everyone, let everyone see but on that note, I want to share something else. And everybody doesn't have it. It's it's still in the beta form, so they're still, you know, working out the kinks. Everybody don't have it. Karen, we was talking about sharing stories and how we can connect with family members. Mm -hmm. I want to share something with you here. This is the blog that I, I, and I really enjoy writing this too. So let me just say, over here, the popular post right here, Quincy Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the number one story. And you know what? In everyone's genealogy, there's history. There's something in there for them. I want to share something with you. How many readers that the blog has? You see? 436,700. Oh, wow. Yes. That's a lot. So, that's a lot. And what that basically means, Karen that I am getting the history out, you know, of the local areas. Mm -hmm. And I try to create a, I try to make sure that there's an image in all of my stories because, you know, Karen, people love to look at pictures. Right. Now, let me say this about this particular story. Um, hopefully it comes back. Wait a uh, let me go back Karen that particular story that is the new movie Emancipation mm -hmm. this is the fourth great granddaughter wow of whipped Peter or Peter Gordon you know this is let me just stroll down sorry it's taking so long we're gonna get there Why is it taking so bad? All right, let's see. Here it is. She invited me to her house. Mm -hmm. And that's what the movie Emancipation is about. Her fourth great granddaughter. 
And wow. she had, yes. So that really inspired me to continue to document these stories. You know, family history is not just about looking for like all the names and the birthdays and debt records and all that. It is also about the stories that come out of the research, you know. Absolutely. I was talking to my husband about this today. Uh, we were talking about how some of our enslaved ancestors were able to do amazing things after they were emancipated. Uh, after uh, the end of the Civil War, five years later, we see people owning land. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, how, 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 how were my Nelson relatives able to buy land so quickly after they had been enslaved? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. once you start looking up your relatives and, 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 and seeing the document, you, there's a story around these documents. That's right. That's a story. And, and we always got to keep in mind there's a story like Bernice's new book, you know, the black homesteaders, there's a story. You know, I'm going to try and I, and, and I thank everybody for being patient with us because we'll learn this system. You know, mm -hmm. we are really learning how to work this thing. Uh, let's see. I did something wrong. Well, we didn't. Uh, I want to pull up my new book. Huh? Yes. We didn't see what I you did pull up. <laughs> I want to pull up Bernice's new book, uh, okay. The Black Homesteaders. Uh-huh. Because the very thing that you're talking about is what Bernice was saying in her book. You know, we was doing big things and I can't wait to get her on to talk about, uh, I think I got it. I got it. Just give me a minute. I got it. Got it. There we go. The Black Homesteaders of the South. Mm -hmm. It's a collaboration of stories. Um, and when you said after slavery, look at it, what it says, the Homestead Act of 1862, mm -hmm. the Emancipation Proclamation and subsequently Reconstruction Amendment did not did not just abolish slavery. It gave African-Americans a chance to earn and live in their own land. You know, so that so much comes out of this. Uh, I am just I'm just so excited because what her book did, Bernice's book, prove that we was land owners, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was really, you know, I'm very happy for her book. And, and that wasn't always the easiest thing to do in the South is to be a land owner because there was a constant terror, uh, 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 you know, because people uh, who lost the war didn't want to see black people progress. That's right. And 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 they often cheated them out of their land, ran them off their land, and 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 did all kinds of things so that they would not uh be successful. But our people, you know, many of our people uh persevered. Yes, they did and, and retained that we know that some people didn't, mm -hmm. um, but many of our people persevered and 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 some of that land is in families to this very day. That's right. That's right. So I would like to say Nurture and Our Roots would like to really salute Bernice uh, Alexander Bennett for that labor of love. Um, uh, matter of fact, I think I contribute three stories to the book of homesteaders in Louisiana, mm -hmm. Mississippi. Um, she's going to be in Louisiana in February speaking about her book. And some of the contributing authors uh, uh, will be there uh, to talk about their family story, their family land. And that's why I am really working hard to document the stories of the farmers, the black farmers, uh, because I want to know what their plight was. You know, you hear a lot of them say they were discriminated against, you know. Uh, how hard it was, but you know, these are the type of oral histories that needs to be recorded. We need to record these stories and then transcribe them too. have them transcribed so that they could be, you, you know, read in text. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm big on giving people some stuff to do. 
uh, find out, you know, where is it? Where do you go to the country? When you go to the country, where is it? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, does your family own that land? Mm -hmm. Find out the story. The holidays are coming up. You're going to be getting together for the holidays. Find out the story behind the land in the country where y'all go to. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's hard. very important, Karen, because we all know that most of the land, um, sometimes the land is not cleared. Air property is a very complicated matter. And, you know, the further re removed from the original owner of the land going back to 1800s, it just gets so complex because in between the original owner, you may have so many people that have died off since that time. And that makes it very complicated. Absolutely. Really. Absolutely. Any questions or comments coming out of our chat? We have some comments um, coming out of the chat. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody who is in the chat. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in there. And I'll try to make sure we answer them online. Uh, the Real JC says, I've been to a lot of cemeteries in St. Helena, East Feliciana, Town Jipaho, and have saw the grave of many of my slash our uh, ancestors. Um, Ber uh, Bernadine Hobson uh, says that uh, she's definitely going to see emancipation. Um, and uh, she says it's about the stories, resilience, uh, leadership of our ancestors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what his fourth great granddaughter said, that it was the resilience of her great grandfather and and it, it helped her to understand how the jackson family uh stands so strong okay. and bernadine also says some who ran away from slavery changed their names from the slave uh from the slave owner to whatever they wanted and i just want to say a thing about that that's that's true and so one of the things i try to do is track the families in groups so even though the last name might have changed you might still find that group, that grouping moving from one census record to the next or from one location to another. Uh, so that's that's a, a way to to try to help deal with that particular thing, because a lot of people did. Uh, many people never had their slave owners. That's one of the things that I have found. Actually, I have found more often than not uh, the person didn't have their last slave owner's last name. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. people, especially those who were sold from the East Coast to the Deep South, many of them came with uh, slaveholders' last names from the East Coast. Right. Uh, that that manifested, I told you, from um, 1835. Uh, those people did not even have the last name of the slave owner slash shipper who's listed on the manifest. They had some other last names and they were brought here to uh, different slaveholders in Louisiana. So, um, you know, I, I, I consider the surnames during slavery as a placeholder. So that's why you got to really research every member of that family mm -hmm. uh, and, and track all of the different uh, members. And guess what? You also have to um, research the slaveholders family, the purchases family, uh, the shippers, shippers, the shippers yeah. uh, families. You got you to gotta research all of this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, um, we're talking about tips. So if you're going to get started, if you're going to get started, like Karen said earlier, start with yourself and work back and work your way backwards to your mom, your dad. I would strongly suggest that try not to, if you're going to work both families, that means you have to really keep good records, separate records and be very organized because if you're not organized in your research, it can make you not want to do it, believe me, because you can't read your own notes. Uh, you'll say, well, why did I write this down? You know, what, what did I write this for? So be very good in your note taking. And I would strongly suggest if you're interviewing someone, try not to write down everything, just record it, you know, Record it with your phone, you know, a digital recorder, just record it. That way, you know, you would get word for word. Let me also, um, when it comes to uh, documenting people and starting with yourself, uh, I hear from a lot of people 
who are trying to figure out their connection to the whole uh, Georgetown slavery story. And uh, they're, you know, because those names are out there all over the place, they'll pull up one name and say, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I have a DNA match to this person who is, let's say, a Mahoney descendant. Mm -hmm. um, and, but, but their tree has 12 people in it. You know, if you want to be able to figure out how you're connected to some of this history with these universities who realize that they have had, they, that they owe their existence to enslaved people, make sure your tree is solid. Make sure that you start with yourself. Don't try to work your way back from a DNA connection. Uh, start from, right. make sure your tree, that you have as much information in your tree as you could possibly get. And you're, you're never going to get there with 12 people in your tree. You're never going to get there with even 100 people in your tree. You have to research, you know, add all of your great aunts, great uncles, add, put all of these people in your tree. And I want to also say, be careful about taking information from other people's trees. And the reason I want to say that is because uh, someone put someone on our family tree. And I know that that is not a sibling, a child of um, Alexandra and, and Emma. I tried to tell them that, but they did not remove it. So it's still there. And so that is not, and I've seen that name and I know for a fact that person is not one of the children. Now, this is a younger person, uh, two generations behind me. And so what they did, they just took what was on a, on a census connected to another tree that is someone else's tree. Uh, so please don't take somebody else's tree as the truth. There's a lot of trash trees on Ancestry. So Lots Ancestry used these trash trees, trees that have inaccurate information, mm -hmm. and they create their through lines process. The through lines is only as good as the accuracy of the trees. That's right. And there is a particular line of my husband, my husband's butler family. There are people out there constantly copying this family tree and it is wrong. It is wrong. So there are hundreds and hundreds of people out there who, who, who are descendants and, and people who think they're descendants who are putting wrong information in the tree. So uh, take ancestries through lines as hints. You still have to research it when you're looking at somebody else's tree or any of the, the through lines and even a little green shaky leaf hints, you still have to do the research and connect them through documents to your family member. If you can't That's connect right. them through documents to your family member, I don't recommend adding them to your tree. <laughs> I said the same thing, Karen, because, um, and I, I wrote them a nice little note. And I said to them that this person is not linked to our family tree, but they didn't remove it. So it can be very misleading to someone who knows absolutely nothing and would just assume that this person has some correct information. Now, a tip to the younger people. Yeah, I, I'm very excited that you are really, really want to do you know, the family research, you are out there researching, you see a lot of information on the internet. Um, and it depends on, you know, who tr who's transcribing, who's submitting the information. So you have to double check everything and make sure it's accurate information. But if you're a younger person just getting started, please, you know, get in contact with someone if you have someone in the family that has been researching the family for years and years and decades, get in contact with them. That's the first thing that we do out of the line of respect for the research. You know, um, it's, it's a dishonor for us to do research without talking to the older people in the family or going to them and getting information, Karen, because they have so much to share. We just can't assume more oh, technology have everything today. So we're just going to go ahead and do this by technology. And you just don't know. 
you know. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, in the chat, uh, the real JC wants to know, where do you find the manifest? Uh, you can find, you could Google slave manifest. Um, or inward bound, inward I N W A R D inward bound manifest, but they're also on ancestry. The ones that I was looking at the other day, uh, they're on ancestry. So uh, you can uh, search on ancestry for uh, inward bound um, slave manifest, or put in keyword slave manifest. And Karen, I am so happy that when I started in 1994, they didn't have half of this information <laughs> that's available. I mean, you really had to go there and, and you didn't think twice about it because you was just excited to read microfish and microfish and microfilms, you know, so we have come a long way from those days. That's for sure. Absolutely. You, you couldn't have told me that I could find an actual ship manifest. Now we might not be able to find all of them, but uh, you can find ship manifest uh, coming from um, the East Coast. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to find a manifest coming from Africa because they didn't record our ancestors' names on no manifest coming from Africa. But um, there, at least you while, haven't seen it, huh? At least I haven't seen it. But mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. many of our ancestors were walked from the East Coast into the Deep South, uh, I know that, uh, especially coming out of that Maryland, Virginia area, a lot of people were sent here on um, ships because mm -hmm. you know, it, it was easy to just come right into the port of New Orleans. Uh, and, and, and they, they, they had a, a constant revelation, uh, a revolution of, of ships coming from the East coast into the port of New Orleans. Well, mm -hmm. and, and let me tell you something. Do not think that genealogy ends because it is a never ending project or you journey. You never finish your tree, okay? You never finish your tree. You never, Don't ever think, you know, um, and make sure that you do not get burned out. So don't start so strong and, you know, you want to go at it strong for two months and then you put it down for five years and never pick it up again. That happens a lot of times, you know, uh, because. In your research, most likely you will hit a brick wall. You know, it's almost guaranteed to hit a brick wall in your research. Uh, 30 years and I still have a brick wall. And so each time I find a little bit more to bring that brick wall down, like Priscilla, uh, the Blackburns, I have never found any records uh, because she was enslaved. She uh, was 69 when she got married in 1870, you know, so she, she was already up in age, she and her husband. And so 1870, 1880, well, you basically didn't see her husband, Randall. And so there was nothing listed about Priscilla Blackburn, Harrell. And so that means how would we find any information looking at the black burns in that area? Did they, because she said she was born in South Carolina. So did she come from South Carolina to Louisiana with that last surname Blackburn, or did she pick that name up here? So in union parish, I really have to look at all the black burns in union parish. If there's any, yeah, I thought on the eighteen um I thought on the eighteen seventy census, or was it the eighteen eighty? One of those since she said she was born in Mississippi. So Well, I know um, Robert said he was born in Mississippi. Okay, maybe it was Robert yeah, then. Robert said he was born in okay. Mississippi uh in on December the twelfth, eighteen twenty one. So he died at 100. So he said he was born in Mississippi. Okay. So that tells me that at one time Priscilla was living in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. If our son say his mother that he was born in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So how did she come down here? Did she come down here with the Blackburns or what? You know, so 
Uh, that's why we was never able to find anything. I didn't find anything on the Blackburn. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that name Blackburn, I was like, okay, I'm very grateful and happy for that name. Yeah, and again, you never know if she brought that name with her from far, far away from even a previous owner. Um, mm -hmm. You just never know. I mean, right. I, because I know so many of my husband's uh, enslaved ancestors were with the Jesuits, and they have multiple different surnames, and we know those are not those weren't the Jesuit surnames. So, mm -hmm. it's, it's, okay, we know that they came from these various families nearby. Right. And um, so I don't actually put a whole lot of effort um, into those those families or trying to figure out which one was the enslaver family. I'm just trying to track the family groups of the ancestors, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just to be able to see, uh, you know, if they're on baptismal records or what have you, um, because I, I, I may not ever find some of those uh, those uh, enslavers. And we it's have to be prepared for that as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have to be prepared for that because, you know, it's a journey. And that's why we want you to take this journey with us as we do a lot of self-discovering through genealogy. And that's what genealogy is. It is self-discovery. You're learning who you're related to. You're learning so many things. And let me just say this before we close out for tonight. Um, I have not found any church records as strong as the Catholic church, keeping genealogical records, not the Baptist uh, associations or uh, church of God in Christ, Jehovah witnesses or whatever it is. So, so just like talking to the funeral homes and asking them to consider preserving those um, uh, funeral programs, that's the same thing we have to do with the churches and keeping up with a, I guess, a, a ledger uh, as to who's buried in the cemetery. Cause you know, at one time, Karen, that was deacon boards and that was uh, different types of auxiliaries in the church. Well, those different committees took that very serious, but mm -hmm. see, you don't have those type of committees anymore where people are maintaining the cemeteries or maintaining records, you know, which is just as equally important. That's right. Um, it's it's not there anymore. But if you're a member of a church, ask them to store. Exactly. Just ask it's them never to too late. When you get ready to have your, your baby baptized, ask them to start tracking that information. Start writing it down. And once again, uh, before we close out, we would just like to say to you, you know, keep good records and very organized records because uh, I don't want to tell you I had 30 years of information, community genealogy, and I'm just now getting that information to the universities, uh, the Amistad, uh, the library, because the library did, the East Baton Rouge Parish Library did scan the funeral programs and made, a, made them available online. Mm -hmm. So uh, this has been great. It feels good to be back. We are happy to be back. We thank you all for uh, just being patient with us. But we had to take that time due to COVID. We could not go out and do any conduct, conduct any research, any oral history. So we're back to be back. We're glad to be back for the fall. And uh, we'll be here what, every second Tuesday? Tuesday. Yes, every second Tuesday of the month on uh, multiple multiple platforms. <laughs> and that's what I like, Sharon, uh, Karen. <laughs> multiple platforms, and it's been good. So we want to thank you all for joining us right here on Nurturing Our Roots. And please don't forget to always join us right here every, two, every second Tuesday of the month.